Hello, everybody. Thank you for participating to our beautiful webinar. I'm Alexandre Michy, cardiologist uh, in Montluçon, France. Um, and today I have the pleasure and the honor to uh, um, have uh, as an invite Professor Alain Cribier, uh, which uh, I will pass the word uh, right away. I would just uh, like to thank you for participating to our webinar on behalf of the International Society of Telemedicine and eHealth. And without further delaying our webinar, I'd like to welcome Professor Alain Cribier, the past head of cardiology from Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de, de Rouen in France. And Professor Cribier, as you all know, uh, is uh, the person which uh, invented and developed uh, the TAVI technique as we know it. Thank you so much, Professor Cribier, uh, for joining us in a Friday evening. Uh, and uh, we are all waiting uh, to hear uh, uh, how it all started and what are your, your future insights on, uh, on TAVI. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Michel, for your kind uh, invitation. It's a pleasure to join you. And uh, so I will give uh, you a speech. I will just uh, share my screen first. I hope you get it here. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So um, the the goal of this speech would be to uh, summarize uh, uh, in uh, forty five minutes the uh, the long journey uh, of uh, developing Tavi. It, it is a very an incredible history, and I think uh, uh, you may enjoy to know uh, each step uh, of it. So uh, I am past chief of the Department of uh, Cardiology of the uh, University Hospital of Rouen, France. And uh, I opened um, a huge medical training center in Rouen, and I am now medical advisor of this uh, medical training center. So this is to, just to tell you exactly what I am doing now. Uh, this is my disclosure. I've been for a long time a consulting, uh, a consultant from, uh, for Edwards Life Sciences. So uh, when we, we we will talk about innovation in medicine and uh, it's the same in uh, in uh, out of medicine, but uh, this is uh, the very important sentence of uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the uh, inventor of Facebook, saying that uh, uh, all of those who take initiatives will be criticized because they are going too fast, because there is always someone who wants to slow you down. And uh, as we will uh, understand, it has been exactly. Uh, what I have known during this, uh, this period of time. So uh, in my uh, professional career, uh, I, uh, I could invent uh, some uh, technologies for interventional cardiologies and uh, out of uh, valve disease, but mainly for valvular disease. And uh, as you can see here in uh, 1985, I started with uh, developing balloon aortic valvuloplasty for the treatment of uh, calcific aortic stenosis. Uh, then in 97, I uh, developed a mitral comisprotome, which was a very interesting device, uh, very used uh, uh, in uh, developing countries because this is a metallic device for, the, for dilating the mitral uh, stenosis, uh, which can be re-serialized up to uh, more than 100 times. So uh, this is, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, an economic effect you know, for uh, each procedure. And then I uh, came with the development of transcatheter aortic valve. And as you can understand, there is a direct connection between, uh, between the first invention and the third one, uh, because uh, as I will explain to you, uh, the developing transcatheter aortic valve was uh, aimed uh, uh, with the goal of uh, uh, finding solution for the limitation of balloon aortic valve. So this is the way it works. And uh, I like also this sentence from Edwin Land, don't undertake a project unless it's manifestly important and nearly impossible. And this is, a, this is absolutely uh, related to my uh, topic. So uh, just before I want to let you know that uh, I was very lucky because uh, I have been uh, co-opted in, uh, in the Department of Cardiology of Rouen, uh, France, and uh, received uh, as a resident by this man, uh, Professor Bruce Vitaq, who was uh, the, the chief of the Department of Cardiology at the time in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 72. And uh, this man was very open-minded to uh, clinical research and uh, innovative technologies. So we, we had a, a great complicity together. And also, uh, I have been uh, trained by uh, two uh, a very important person, uh, Jeremy Swam and, and uh, Willie Gans, the, the Swan Gans cast there in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, this has been also a very uh, important milestone, of course, in my, in my career. 
after when I came back from the from the uh, United States uh, in '77, I was uh, very keen at developing uh, new technologies for interventional cardiology and detecting uh, unmet clinical need. And also, uh, I was very lucky to find a, a team which was absolutely unbelievable, uh, made of nurses, technician, uh, coordinator, cardiologists, and surgeons. Uh, with uh, an incredible uh, relationship, and this has been the key for developing these kind of technologies because there was absolutely no war uh, between interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery, which is not very, very frequent. And uh, so uh, we have been working as partners uh, from the very beginning. So uh, what was the, the rationale for developing uh, these transcatheter techniques in aortic stenosis? It was because uh, I recognize an important and for me unacceptable unmet clinical need. You know the uh, you know the uh, the frequency of uh, aortic stenosis uh, and uh, the incidence of this disease in uh, elderly pa elderly patients. You know it uh, it, it uh, uh, involved five to seven percent of people above the age of seventy five years of age. So it's number of people with a very high short term mortality after the onset of symptoms. Uh, after the onset of symptoms, you know, the life expectancy can be reduced to two to three years. And uh, for this uh, disease, uh, we have this uh, fantastic uh, uh, surgical repair and, uh, replacement of the of the aortic valve by, uh, by a valve prosthesis, you know, starting in the 60s with the star Edward valve and moving to the central valve and then to the bioprosthesis developed by another friend's guy, uh, uh, Alain Carpentier, who is a good friend of mine. And uh, this uh, surgical treatment is absolutely uh, perfect, uh, offering low mortality and return to normal life expectancy. But there is a big problem. Uh, no operation can be performed in one third of the patients. So it's a number of patients who cannot be operated on. And uh, in, uh, in the 80s, you know, it was uh, uh, worst because H per se was a contraindication to a surgical valve replacement and the 95% of the surgical patients in Rouen were below the age of 70 years of age. So being above the 70 years of age, you know, you were declined for surgery. And I, uh, I was facing early days of uh, all other patients after multiple rehospitalizations. And uh, uh, this is why I started to, to get interested in finding, uh, uh, to find an alternative um, uh, treatment. So I dared uh, thinking out of the box. Uh, uh, I, I call this season one because it is a season of the balloon aortic valve plastic. I developed the first simple and risky solution and larging the aortic valve or at least the balloon uh, by uh, doing balloon dilatation of the aortic valve. So uh, the first in man case of balloon aortic valve plastic was performed by, uh, by us in, in Rouen in 87 on a 72 year old woman, extremely symptomatic who have been declined for surgery uh, three times uh, because of the age above uh, 70 and the coronary artery disease. So you can see here, the very first balloon aortic valvuloplasty performed cautiously with a small sized balloon and uh, with an unbelievable result, you know, a decrease in gradient which was kind of moderate, but uh, these patients who are so symptomatic remains two years without any symptoms. So, you know, experience is also a part of the game when you uh, innovate in medicine. And uh, I was very lucky to have this result because, uh, because of this, you know, I, uh, I called back all the patients who had been declined for surgery uh, previously. And uh, uh, we did a first series of uh, balloon aortic valve replacement published in The Lancet in 86. And uh, there was a memorable reaction of the medical community. You can see here on um, 86, you know, the first world seminar on balloon aortic valvuloplasty with live cases, which was kind of uh, uh, un, um, unfrequent, you know, at that time in uh, the, doing live cases. So we had the three days uh, seminar, but this was the first one. And in this uh, assembly here, uh, if you were looking closely, you would recognize all the big names in international cardiology of the, of the 90s. And uh, then we, we did uh, several uh, world seminar like this one uh, after this uh, the first one and um, the lunar aortic valvuloplasty uh, became a breakthrough technology uh, which was fiercely criticized by the cardiac surgeons in general but performed in several tens of thousands of patients around the world thus demonstrating the clear cut clinical needs so they all wanted to film and uh, i also uh, got to uh, uh, 
uh, to uh, all the countries in the world, you know, to uh, train people on site. So it was uh, the beginning of a of, of life for me. And uh, between 86 and uh, 92, uh, we had this number of patients uh, dilated. This number of index articles and control registry, you can, you can, uh, you can realize that uh, this is very uh, unusual. And uh, the FDA approved the, the balloneotic valvulopathy in selected indications, but there was a major limitation which uh, was really recognized uh, in the 92s, you know, the, the early risk diagnosis. So uh, how to overcome this limitation? And the only solution that I found was to develop a percutaneous transcatheter valve and uh, this is, uh, uh, I will tell you now how we move to the first uh, in man uh, uh, transcatheter valve. Actually, it's interesting also for those uh, young people who wants to invent some technique, you know, uh, even if it doesn't work immediately or if it's a kind of failure after several years, you know, it can persist. And uh, uh, today, 30 years later, balloonic valve is not at all dead, as you know, you know, uh, we have some specific indications. It's also a prerequisite before opening a heavy center. The technique has been extraordinarily uh, simplified now. You know, it's a piece of cake, you know, to dilate the, the, the valve. We have several times, several value sizes with small size fees, local anesthesia, three days of hospitalization, almost nothing. And also, uh, one of the interests of balloon aortic valvoplasty is that it helped us to develop the rapid ventricular pacing which is the way to stop the heart, you know, during a few seconds, stop the time of uh, blocking the balloon in place and today blocking the valve in place at the time of valve delivery. So it has been extremely useful to, uh, to develop the balloon aortic uh, valvoplasty and uh, which remains part of many uh, valve heavy procedures nowadays. So season two, developing the, uh, the aortic valve, the most challenging crazy concept. So this is what I wanted to do, and uh, this is what I announced in 90, implanting a valve prosthesis within the disease scale technique valve on the beating heart using percutaneous catheter-based technique and local anesthesia. This is absolutely crazy. You know, when you think of that, first of all, uh, you see here the kind of valves that we are facing, you know, with this amount of calcium, the very small orifice and so on. So it looks like uh, being impossible with a heavy calcified valve, so ridiculous to think inserting an artificial valve within such massive calcifications, and also dangerous because uh, the, the aortic valve is located in such a place that we have very uh, important surrounding structures, as you know, coronary arteries above, mitral valve insertion just below. I would say also the his mandal in the, in the intraventricular septum. So it was uh, considered as totally crazy. But uh, this is an extraordinary example, and I, I, I show that for the young people who are watching this presentation, you know, of successful translational research. Translational research is very important. Moving findings from concept to bench to bedside to clinical feasibility trials, larger clinical registry and evidence-based trials, and to wider clinical applications on everyday practice. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a definition of uh, uh, transversal research, and uh, this was uh, very well done here. So uh, the burst of the idea of TAVI, you know, I uh, noted during valvoplasty valve valve that it was always possible to, to open a balloon, to inflate a balloon in such a way that the calcium of the valve was pushed apart uh, uh, around it. So uh, the strength of four atmospheres was able to uh, mobilize the calcium, and uh, so we could introduce something inside the valve. So this was a very important observation, and uh, I got to the idea that maybe it would be possible to use this opportunity of balloonic valve plastic to implant a, a stent at the same time. But of course, a stent alone was not enough, and we had to have valvular structure uh, within the attached within the stent, obviously. And uh, the diseased valve uh, would not have to be removed like the surgeon doing, but at the opposite, the, the valve might be a support to anchor the stent. And uh, so we came with the concept of stented valve, a challenging combination of valve and expandable frame and valvular structure. So first of all, we had in Rouen to uh, validate the concept of intravalvular stenting, as I, uh, I explained to you. And we had to answer these questions. Can the stent keep the calcified valve open? 
which optimal dimension of the frame, what would be the risk of stent embolization. So this was the baseline, you know, to start thinking about implanting a valve. So uh, we uh, took a series of patients who died of uh, calcium carotid stenosis, and in these patients, uh, we implanted with my team, and uh, particularly uh, Ellen Shaninoff, who is now chief of the department of cardiology, you know, implant stent in the calcium carotid stenosis of patients who died of uh, AF. And you see here that the stent can be implanted fully open and with a circular opening, so cross section. So this is also something very important if you think of a valve. And uh, then we uh, we uh, cut the uh, aorta uh, longitudinally, and uh, we could observe that we had enough room. You know, this is a stent here on the analyst. This is the aortic valve, and we have here uh, the coronary ostia, which are clearly above the mitral valve insertion below and the intraventricular septum below. So it means that uh, with this uh, anatomic findings, we came to the conclusion that it was possible to uh, make a valve if the height of the valve was not more than 14 to 16 millimeter, not to occlude these uh, coronary arteries. And I said that uh, maybe a diameter of 23 millimeter would be enough in the patient. So this was a false uh, consideration because uh, we realized later on that uh, we needed a larger size diameter in many patients. And also to remove the, to disconnect the, to remove the stent from this place, we had to use uh, forceps, traction, so the risk of mobilization was low. And this was totally con con uh, confirmed you know, by this uh, cadaver study done by uh, Renu Viamani, a great uh, an anatomopathologist of the United States. You know, we, she, she was not believing that it was possible to make that. And she did exactly the same experiment with the uh, cadavers of the uh, aortic uh, stenosis patients. And you see, she could open a stent circular, even in this uh, uh, extraordinary calcific uh, uh, setting of the aortic valve. And also uh, to remove the stent from here, she had to use a traction force of more than two kilograms to dislodge the stent. So it means that the risk of embolization was low. So after that, you know, I, uh, I drew this uh, model of valve uh, uh, for a patent, for a European patent, and uh, it could be a, a stainless steel stent uh, and uh, with a track valve or unique speed or, uh, or trigger speed. Uh, polymer or biologic uh, valve, and uh, with uh, our surgeon in France, uh, in Rouen, uh, Jean-Paul Bessou, we, uh, we made this model of valve. It was not to be implanted in human, just to, to uh, show that it was how it could look like. And uh, so you can see here the stent, you have a track speed valve uh, made of very thin tissue inside. And uh, when the valve was screened over a balloon catheter, the diameter of the, the, the assembly here was eight millimeters. So it, mean, it means that uh, even with this model of valve, uh, it would be compatible to the transdermal access in, in many patients, because of course I had in mind to do that transdermal retrograde from the femoral artery. So I, I uh, tried to look for sponsor. You know, uh, we, we needed money to make this uh, project uh, uh, to make this project, and uh, it was turned down by every company with uh, this uh, consideration that it was impossible, a uh, major life cycling issue, and uh, this number of complications, you know, would never be approved by FDA. So all the surgeons who are the experts of all medical companies, I say all medical companies in every country of the world, including Edwards and Medtronic that, uh, that I contacted first, and, and they said it's a most stupid idea and just forget it. So this is the way we started. So uh, to um, try to overcome this uh, discouraging consideration from the companies, we created a, a, a startup uh, with uh, Martin Leon that you know very well, you know, the, the famous cardiologist from the United States and two engineers from Johnson & Johnson, Sandro and Sarah Blinovich, and we, we made a startup that we called Percutanus Valve Technology to develop the valve ourselves. And uh, we found a company in Israel, you can see a very small company in Israel uh, named Aran R&D. And uh, this uh, company has been our first sponsor. And also, of course, they have been developing uh, the device. So uh, the clinical requests to the engineers were very high. You know, of course, this made of resistant, uh, highly resistant frame, opening a valve, able to be emogenously compressed of a high pressure balloon making possible the introduction into the femoral artery. So seven to nine millimeter in diameter. 
able to be enlarged by bellwing inflation to a diameter of 23 millimeters without any damage to the frame and the value of the structure. You can imagine the challenge, you know, it was very, very difficult. And so we had uh, this uh, philosophy of the transcat valve uh, based on uh, some hemodynamic um, features, you know, like uh, a very low gradient, uh, proper coaptation of the leaflets, uh, the, the tissue deflection matching and so on. The safety was also an important point. I have to make it a little fast, but uh, we, we needed a low cream profile. Uh, we had to minimize the interference with anatomy, and uh, we had also to work on the durability. We needed a resistant leaflet tissue with a uniform uh, stress distribution of leaflets, uh, resisting to calcification and so on. So they, uh, they worked and they worked out and they came with some uh, uh, prototypes which were not uh, really interesting. And so finally, the, the, the device that they made eventually was this uh, PVT valve, percutane resolved technology valve that you can see here, which looks like the valve that we are implanting now, you know, with a, um, a laser a manufactured um, uh, stainless steel stand uh, with a tri valve, which was initially made of polymer. Then they came with equine pericardium, and then they came with bovine pericardium later on. And uh, so this valve was tested in, uh, multi, in, uh, in uh, the laboratory, and it was a fantastic work, you know, to, to uh, really uh, experiment this out uh, on these different parameters. And then uh, we moved to the, the animal model, and uh, with my uh, my uh, my uh, colleague Ellen Shaminov, we have been working in the Montreux Hospital in Paris, you know, uh, to uh, implant uh, this kind of device. Uh, which is here print over a new med balloon cast there and uh, inside the carotid artery of the feet model and uh, so we uh, we could uh, uh, implant the valve at the uh, uh, orthotopic position in the aorta in the, uh, in the aorta and different places in the aorta in the pulmonary artery and so on and uh, this was absolutely encouraging but unfortunately you know uh, it's uh, very difficult to get a long term uh, observation of this valve, but we developed uh, with Hélène uh, a very special program, you know, that allowed us to follow the stent uh, more than uh, five months uh, in the fit model. And so we had this uh, view of the valve uh, closing and opening on the transesophageal echo, and uh, uh, we had this uh, anatomic findings, you know, showing that everything fine, there was no uh, protrusion of endothelium or or calcifications or nothing else. So this was encouraging, but uh, you know the limitation uh, of the animal model. And again, I say that for the youngest uh, cardiologist here, uh, even though you know the anatomy of the model, the sheep or eventually the, the, the pig uh, is fairly similar to the human, you know, even minor differences in physiology and anatomy can, can affect the, the, the result the safety and efficacy of the, what we are planning to do. So you have to be extremely careful because in uh, the animal models, you know, we have no aortic valve calcifications. Uh, we have no aortic valve degeneration and different arch anatomy. So uh, the, the decision of moving to human was extremely difficult. And, uh, you know, you can imagine that it was, it was uh, something uh, strange and uh, difficult to schedule. So uh, actually, we, we were pushed, you know, we moved from dream to reality because we received a, a patient in Rouen, a, a, a very young patient, 57 years of age, you know, with multiple comorbidities and uh, uh, with an intraventricular thrombus. He was in cardiogenic shock with an ejection fraction of 12%. And uh, he had an aorto femoral graft occluded, so there was no possible femoral access. And uh, the, the people asked us to save his life, you know, so uh, I, I did, uh, I tried the uh, Emerson transdeptal balloon aortic valgeoplasty since we didn't have any uh, acceptable thermal access, but he was back in shock in 24 hours, and we had to take the decision of the transdeptal heavy uh, as a life-saving procedure in this very first patient, so it was something very, very difficult decision to take for the uh, percutaneous lab technology team. Because the patients so actually, as you can see here, had all turned contraindications of TAVI. So uh, this is exactly what we did on April 16, 2002. Uh, you know, we we uh, we had to use this uh, transfemoral approach from the femoral van, 
and uh, turning here around the Trondus was floating, which was floating in the in the Levant, so, and uh, pushing the valve to the uh, the aorta. So uh, this this was a little chance, you know, to to do this procedure. You have here the gadwar crossing the septum here, going to the left ventricle, and exiting finally to the uh, to the femoral artery on the other side. And uh, we, you see the valve has, has been pushed over the gadwar and placed in the middle of the calcium here. The valve has been open, and the, the, the patient was almost in cardiac arrest at that time. And you see immediately, you know, the improvement of the gradient, no gradient. The, the, the raise of the uh, the aortic uh, um, pressure. Uh, on the same uh, setting, you know, we stopped uh, all vasopressive drugs and the pressure was good. And uh, uh, you can see here the, the, the patient immediately after the valve was implanted. So this is the very first patient, the very first echocardiography done uh, on the cardiac catheterization table. And the patient is now smiling. And the, the same patients, eight days later, totally resuscitated. And so this was a, a very great case published in the Lancet in in, in, in the circulation. I'm sorry, in January '86, with a tremendous effect on the on the medical community. So you see uh, that uh, it was not uh, really relaxed and uh, quiet and peaceful. You know, this uh, first implantation. You know, and especially at the time of valve positioning, because we had absolutely no experience where to push it uh, to to uh, to open it exactly. And uh, see here the the, the <laughs> I like this uh, picture you know showing the the anxiety and the uh, the, the stress you know of the of the team and uh, from this first uh, case you know we could conclude that it was feasible to implant a valve uh, that we could place it accurately uh, there was no embolization no coronary occlusion no mitral regurgitation no AV block and only a mild uh, AR in these patients with optimal valvular function of the prosthesis and excellent hemodynamics. So this was the pure translation of our autopsy findings of 94. And uh, we have here the first uh, uh, scan uh, uh, obtained you know, in this patient showing uh, the valve, uh, which is clearly below the level of the coronary arteries, as you can see here, and uh, not, not impairing the upper part of the septum with a heat bundle, and uh, not touching the mitral valve. So this was also a confirmation of our findings of 94. So if you have an idea, you know, don't hesitate to do uh, uh, to use the uh, the cadavers, human cadavers, you know, to prove uh, your uh, concept. Then we did uh, 40 patients in uh, two uh, two successive trials. A compassionate use in human death was uh, asked by the the health authority in France. So we use a transeptal approach in 33 with 85 percent of success, and we started at the end using the retrograde transfemoral approach. Uh, in seven, but we had three failures because we had absolutely no specific delivery system. So the challenge uh, that the uh, the health authority in France asked us to um, follow was to demonstrate the potential benefit of this disruptive technology on a subset of critically ill patients with life-threatening comorbidities. So it was very difficult. So you see the valve, you see the crimping device. Again, the valve came over the balloon. The approach by the femoral band and the, the gadwar exiting from the femoral artery on the other side. Uh, this valve was the one used in the first patients, you know, with equine pericardium, a single size of 23 millimeter. And we had the surprise of seeing these uh, dying patients uh, surviving, not bad, you know, some of them uh, had the early deaths because of the comorbidities, but uh, the four patients survived more than five years. And uh, I will show you uh, an example of that. So uh, this is the way we were implanting the valve. You know, it was a difficult technique, but also we did that under local anesthesia alone. Ne not a single patient uh, was uh, receiving general anesthesia, no transesophageal echocardiography. And uh, it was very well mastered, but it was a long procedure and the patients could be discharged 10 to 15 days after that. So we have this patient here. You know, the, the evolution of the patients was uh, extremely important to, uh, uh, to spread the news in the world, you know, to convince people that it was uh, possible to do that. So we have these patients, uh, dying patients, 83 years old, uh, declined for uh, the, the, a lot of uh, incarnation shock, acute anterior myocardial infarction, declined by the surgeons. And this is uh, to, to, uh, 
two weeks later, you know, you can see the patients now uh, walking in the in the in the hospital. But this is the same patient six months later. So you know, this is absolutely unbelievable. She is now with this uh, family uh, doing extremely well, and the same patients, you know, one year later, it's a patient's number three. So it was very early experience. Uh, just uh, coming to the TCP meeting in Washington, you know, flying and received like a queen, you know, by the community and uh, uh, giving some uh, short speech to the, in a room of, uh, with uh, 2,000 people watching. And uh, uh, these patients, you know, has been a very important element of the, to bring the conviction about this technology uh, to, uh, to, the, to the world. So you can see the same patients two years later three years later, four years later, five years later, and finally 6.5 years later per study. And she came to Rouen uh, for uh, a seminar on uh, TABI, and uh, she had an echo live, you know, to demonstrate the, that the, the valve was absolutely working normally, absolutely no change in the valve area, 1.7 square centimeter with a gradient of 12 millimeter of mercury, she was doing perfectly fine. And uh, unfortunately, she died a few months later of a breast cancer. And we also have this embarrassing patients, you know, patients number 10. So it was, again, the very early phase where for the first time uh, we had the, um, a retrograde approach, uh, which was accepted by the, the French authorities because the patients also had uh, uh, mitosinosis. She was in cardiogen talk and uh, she was really transferred in a pre-mortem state and uh, uh, emergent TAVI retrograde approach and this is the result, you know, absolutely unbelievable. And five, five years later, the patient is doing perfectly well. So uh, you see, uh, you know, the, the, the this video is not working, but you see that now we are going retrograde like we do today. And this is the valve, the position, the aortic valve, and the result on the gradient. So this, uh, this patient's number 10, you know, gave us a good vision of the future of them. Then uh, the TAVI uh, take, took his flight in the world. So uh, we uh, convinced uh, Martin Leon, Biloni, John Webb, and Colombo in Milan to uh, try uh, to implant the valve concept. And then in 2004, we had 100 uh, valves uh, implanted. Then Edward's life sciences acquired PVT. And so this was uh, the most important milestone you know, because uh, this company, we initially refused to help us, but was really fighting to get that technology uh, in uh, 2004. You know, they have been uh, rapidly developing new valves, not very different of the first one. The Cribier Edwards first uh, was moved to the Edwards Tatian uh, just one year later with two different sizes, 23 and 26 millimeter, treated bovine pericardium. Actually, it's a Carpentier Edwards uh, leaflet. The valve, uh, you know, implanted inside a stent with a 50% external coverage to limit the risk of uh, aortic regurgitation. And uh, they have been working in developing a special delivery uh, catheter, which was called a retroflex catheter, uh, which was uh, done by uh, uh, John Webb in Canada. And they developed also an alternative approach, mini invasive surgical approach, without uh, cardiac arrest or external for me, you know, just a, a puncture of the apex of the left ventricle and positioning the valve uh, right uh, a few centimeters later down. And uh, this was done by, uh, by uh, uh, Michael Mack and Frederick Moore. And I was there for the very first case of Transetical and it was absolutely fascinating. At the same time came a concurrent device, the core valve. It was not at, at that time the Medtronic core valve that we have now, but it was a core valve. Uh, with uh, three uh, an engineer also from France, you know, we developed this self-expanding valve. So this is another story. So in 2005, the Edward Sapien era, uh, offering the retrograde transfemoral approach in 50% of the cases due to the size of the sheath, it was relatively big, 22 French or 24 French, according to the different sizes. You can see here the valve queen and the retroflex delivery system, which was uh, uh, offer the possibility of being angulated just to cross the aortic valve and to, and to pass the, uh, the naked valve, so it's extremely convenient. And uh, this was the first terrible uh, delivery cast that they offered. And so the other patients, 50% uh, again, uh, were having the transeptical approach. At this stage, no one could have predicted the, the rapid uh, evolution of study. 
uh, the refinements and simplifications of the procedure, the spectacular amount of steady scientific evidences, and the striking acceptance of the procedure by the medical community and the steady growth worldwide. So you see here, uh, one of the, the important uh, aspects you know, was the, in the technological improvement, uh, moving from uh, of three uh, different generation of valves, the, the Edward Sapien in 2005, the, the Sapien XT in 2009, and the Sapien 3 in, in 2012. So uh, at each each, at each phase of this uh, evolution, you know, we had the decreased feed size uh, down to 14, 16 French, as we are having today with the second three, and also a multiplication of that size, two sizes, three sizes, four sizes, between 20 and 29 millimeter, the sizes that we are using today, and which allow us to uh, face uh, any kind of anatomical uh, property of the, of the patient's aortic valve. So uh, on the, the core valve uh, hand, it was exactly the same, you know, they moved from 21 French because there was no balloon inside, so to 18 French and then 14 French with every car and also multiplication of sizes. This is the two valves that we are uh, implanting today. So uh, it made, it facilitated considerably the, the, the performance of the uh, daily procedure. You know, this is the, the Edward Sapien era in 2005, we had to cut down the femoral artery at the groin and we were asking the cardiac surgeon here to be with us to, uh, to open and to close uh, the, the, the femoral artery and the spleen. So it was a little complex, you know, we, we were three or four people, you know, for doing this procedure. But in Rouen, uh, we did that all the patients uh, with local anesthesia and conscious sedation. And so uh, this is absolutely unbelievable, but uh, we have now more than 3,000 patients done in, in our department, and only one patient received general anesthesia. So the procedure duration with the transformer approach was two hours, and the, the patients could be discharged eight to 10 days later. Then came the Sapien XT era. So you see here a modification of the aortic valve, which looks uh, much better. The stent is now in cobalt chromium, and uh, we have the possibility of decreasing the, uh, the, the sheath size uh, to uh, 16 to 20, which was already a very big progress uh, because the valve is crimped over the shaft of the catheter and not over the balloon immediately. You know, we have to do this alignment procedure in the aorta of the patient. So it decreases the size at the entry site, which was extremely good. So uh, less people in the room, as you can see here, uh, two nurses only, one from rapid pacing and the other one for crimping the valve. And uh, at that time, we have been pioneering against the opinion of everyone in the world. You know, uh, even in France, uh, they were very reluctant, you know, to uh, to accept this uh, minimalist transformer approach, which means uh, local anesthesia, pure percutaneous approach, no transesophageal echo, quick closure with the device, and procedural duration of one hour. Patient discharged less than three days in 50 percent of cases at that time with the Sapien XT. So this was a big progress. And today we have this uh, uh, new valve, you know, which is the Sapien 3 uh, that everybody knows, you know, with the uh, issues of 14 to 16 French. So of course we do the minimalist approach in, in all, but it's becoming a very stamp-like procedure. You know, only two people needed, you know, to implant the valve and the, the procedure duration has uh, came back to, uh, to 30 minutes. And the, the, the duration in intensive care units is less than 24 hours. An early discharge can be obtained in 75% uh, below three days and uh, below two days in 50%. So this is a fantastic uh, uh, improvement of the procedure. During that time, during the, the, the next, uh, the, during this period of time, you know, we had many, many valves, uh, which has been developed by different companies or investigated, but a few of them uh, stayed in the race, you know, they, they disappeared one after the other. And today uh, in Europe, as you know, we have the possibility of implanting three other, uh, three other valves, the Accurate Neo, the Portico, we, we had the possibility of uh, using the Lotus A to Boston Scientific, but now it's dead. So today we have only two uh, concurrent devices on the market in Europe. And I feel that uh, this one has a very uh, bright future. This is an eye valve from India, uh, from the company Merrill. And this is a, it's a balloon expandable valve, the only uh, competitive balloon expandable device on the market uh, with uh, a lot of uh, particularities 
and uh, which uh, I think uh, have a kind of a great, uh, a bright future. So the transformer leading approach has become uh, number one in uh, more than 90% of the cases now because of the reduced size of the device. And uh, the uh, many alternative approach have been, has been uh, uh, developed you know, so in case uh, the thermal approach is not available. And today, uh, we, the trans is almost dead. You know, the direct aortic uh, is uh, in competition with the trans approach in, in a few patients. And uh, we have the, the also uh, something else, which is the uh, Benakava to aorta approach, which is uh, developed in the United States, particularly, which is also kind of uh, interesting alternative approach. So in the United States, and it's interesting to see this slide because the American, you know, they were absolutely reluctant uh, to use the, the transformal approach in so many patients, and especially under local anesthesia, instead of general anesthesia, and without a transepagal echo, they were fighting against me. But today, you see what, what's going on in the United States, where 94% of the patients uh, done uh, using the transformal approach with local anesthesia in 80%, so it means that they have been finally convinced. And the alternative approach, femoral, transepical, transeotic, uh, uh, the uh, transepical and transeotic has been decreased to uh, 1, 1.5%. 1, so uh, this is the way it works uh, today. So also the scientific evidence you know, have been absolutely uh, fundamental uh, for the development of these technologies. You see here the efforts made by uh, the company Edwards you know, to do a registries between 2002 and 2007. But the, the evidences, the scientific evidences came uh, from 2007 with randomized trial. You know this trial very well, the, 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 the partner one, partner two, and partner three. Uh, and uh, this is absolutely extraordinary. You know, this, uh, this has been the most important milestones, uh, each after, uh, one after the other, you know, to convince uh, uh, people. With FDA approval in 2012, 16, and 18 of this uh, different category of patients. And exactly the same thing with the core valve, you know, in high risk, intermediate risk patients and low risk patients, randomized trial. So I, I just show you this because uh, just to illustrate what, what I'm saying, if I have time, you know, here in 2011, you know, inoperable patients, you know, told uh, study was compared to medical treatment alone. And uh, you see here the 26 percent reduction in mortality uh, up to 60 uh, months. And so this was very convincing, and the FDA approved the technique, uh, saying that TAVI is markedly superior to medical treatment in inoperable patients. And uh, in high risk patients, you know, we have this uh, partner one uh, A uh, trial uh, showing that the mortality uh, compared TAVI uh, with uh, surgery uh, was absolutely similar, up to 60 months. And in the high risk survival trial, uh, where surgery was compared to uh, TAVI. Uh, we had even a superiority of study over surgery uh, at uh, one year. So th this was extremely important in very old population of eight years of age. You know, study showed to be equal or superior to surgery in Irish patients uh, on the criteria of, uh, of uh, mortality at death from any cause. Now uh, came the uh, lower risk population, you know, the intermediate risk patients, and we had again two randomized trials with Edwards and Metronic valve, intermediate risk patients, and showing that uh, grossly, I, I, I say that very quickly, but in, in uh, big populations, uh, we had absolutely no difference in death from any cause or disabled stroke uh, with the, the Edwards Sapien and Metronic compared to surgery. And so this was also extremely convincing and published in New England that be comparable to surgery at two years in intermediate risk patients. So very important. But the, the, the cherry and the cake came uh, recently with the low risk population above the age of 65, but low risk patients, I mean uh, the, the old comers, uh, with the two randomized trials of with Edwards and Metroni showing a big superiority of PAVR. Uh, over surgery on death stroke and rehospitalization one year, and uh, no difference between surgery and PIVR at two years with the death and disabled stroke as the primary uh, criteria with metronic low risk. So the conclusion was that be better than uh, surgery at one year in low risk patients, that be non inferior to surgery at two years in low risk patients. 
So because of that, you know, in uh, August uh, 2019, it was the apocalypse study, uh, the FDA approved study, whatever the, what, what, whatever the risk of the patients over the age of 65. So we had some advantage, clear cuts, you know, circuit advantages of study over surgery in the Sapien and, and the Medtronic group. And uh, after the approval of the FDA, a European recommendation in low risk patients came and they authorized uh, all the, uh, uh, the patients above the age of 75, uh, low risk, you know, 75, not 65, like in the United States. But actually, they said that uh, between 65 and 75, we could discuss with the patients and uh, we leave the patients take the decision. And actually, in France, for example, TAVI now is reimbursed in all the patients, whatever the risk, above the age of 65. So this is a fantastic uh, news. So this is where we are today, you know, uh, with the two uh, major uh, devices implanted, uh, we are reaching 1,500,000 procedures in 60 uh, countries, and uh, we are expecting a growth of 40% per year of this market. You know, in 2020 alone, we had 100, 163,000 implanted in the world. And uh, you see the way it will work in the coming years. And also, uh, we have an expansion of TAVI to other indications. I don't develop, but you heard about the Valvintal, you know, performing routine for degenerative bioprosthesis. Uh, TAVI now can be uh, used in bicuspid valve. Uh, which was not sure, but now we know that the, the results are absolutely uh, identical. And uh, we have also some trials on several asymptomatic AS, moderate AS, and cardiac failure. And so, so, the continuous involvement of our team in the field of TAVI, uh, we have been pioneering the transformal minimized approach in 2012. Uh, we, uh, we are included in international training. We are doing international training programs in TAVI. So, uh, I, uh, I tell you that because if you are interested, we have the next uh, uh, training program on TAVI uh, on, by webinar on the 15th of December, 15th, uh, 16th, and 17th of December. We have multiple proctoring programs worldwide. Uh, we are included in French registry, and we have also obtained a very important research uh, program uh, paid by the French government uh, on aortic stenosis and trying to understand exactly why patients are developing the disease, not the other, how to prevent the progression of the disease and how to treat it. So it has been a long bumpy road, you know, to, uh, to uh, develop this technology uh, from balloon aortic vandroplasty in 85 uh, to the current situation expansion to all corners of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the TAVI valve uh, from 2019 with different model valve. And but it lasted 30 years uh, since the balloon aortic valvoplasty to now, and 18 years uh, since the, the first in man. Actually, 20 years, we are almost celebrating the first in man case. And, uh, we will celebrate the, 14, uh, the first in man uh, uh, case uh, next year uh, in the month of May. So the expansion of future of TAVI, we can discuss of that if we have time, but uh, TAVI has been conceived for patients who are not optimal candidates for surgery. And now surgery is indicated in patients, in the only patients who are not optimal candidates for TAVI. So it's a big deal. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. So uh, we have a lot of questions to ask you. Um, that leaves us around 10 minutes. Uh, I was really impressed by, by the way that you, you continued to, um, to progress uh, and to be dedicated to, uh, to developing this valve. You, you uh, um, initially stated that uh, everybody thought you were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, some people still think that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, this is a, a huge, uh, huge uh, problem that uh, maybe future or colleagues or uh, young cardiologists have to overcome um, to believe in their dreams and to pursue their dreams. I at least this is what what I uh, I understood, and I think it's a very important message. And I also um, very much appreciated. Uh, that you 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 uh, emphasize emphasize the role of the team that surrounds you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 
had you as a as a leader, but I, I think uh, also the the team um, also um, uh, left left the mark. Um, mm -hmm. So, just before we we start with the technical questions, what would you uh, advise the young cardiologists nowadays uh, with regards either to starting the project or a startup uh, and maybe um, uh, later on talk to, to like a, a, a life advice for their career. Yes, well, actually, if you want to uh, innovate uh, in medicine today, like uh, yesterday, you know, uh, first of all, you have to find a good reason to do that because uh, this is, uh, this was impair your regular life, you know, considerably for 10 years at least. And so you have to detect the, the clinical needs and uh, you, you cannot just try to improve this or that, you know, but if you want to innovate, it means uh, starting from zero to develop something else. Uh, you have, uh, first of all, to detect the, where are the clinical needs. Secondly, you have to convince yourself that you are not crazy. You know, you have to find a, you have a solution. You have to find solution in your, in your head. You know, I, I was trying to find solution while, while I was driving my car. You know, on the highway between Rouen and Paris, you know, how can, what can I do? How, how can we do that? And so on. So you have to convince yourself. If you convince yourself, then you have to convince the other. And uh, first of all, starting with your team. And the, the, it, it, this is why the, the team uh, that you have around you, your, your closest partners, are the ones that we, uh, in, with whom you will discuss immediately uh, your idea. And uh, according to their uh, reaction, uh, you can uh, modulate your thinking. And then uh, there is a very important part of the game, you know, which is to be uh, to, to try to demonstrate that uh, your idea is good. And so, uh, in uh, cardiology and especially in cardiology, I think that uh, uh, you have to uh, you really have to do um, autopsy, uh, try an autopsy, you know, uh, to try on the on the heart model. Uh, you know, you can you can use a deep heart or you, but the human heart is much better if you have to invent something new, uh, because uh, you will understand immediately whether it's totally crazy or not, and uh, and uh, so it can uh, encourage you very much. And then you have to go through the, uh, the, the 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 partnership with the company because you need money. And uh, I don't know how it is probably in the United States is very different, but in Europe, uh, it's not that easy to find a, a sponsor. Uh, you know, because uh, if you start, and especially if you have a very good big idea, then it costs a lot of money. You know, for the development of the, the valve, it costed five millions. You know, to uh, to just to get across the, the first hurdles. You know, to, to jump uh, uh, above. And so uh, you have to really try to find a partner. And if you cannot find a partner, uh, you have to think about creating a startup. And this is a good idea. And it's, this is. When I did that, you know, it was very unusual at the time. But uh, now, you know, everybody, you know, when they have an idea, they create a startup. And then uh, you, you, you can get some money, you know, to start with and then try to, to find a partner to, to be the partner of your startup and to invest in your startup. This is the way it works. And uh, today, this is what you have to do most of the time. But it's never easy, never. <laughs> you just have to to follow your dream, and yes. uh, um, uh, I, I I really everybody everybody looks at you like like a god in cardiology. So okay. we really appreciate the lessons you 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 taught us, and uh, of course the the technical advancements that that you um, you you managed to um, to 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 get out and uh, to to publish. Um, and the imp impression, the, uh, I'm very impressed by the number of TAVI worldwide, so it boomed. Um, just regarding, uh, uh, regarding um, the TAVI indications in France, can you just restate uh, what, until what age we can implant a TAVI if the patient requires us to do that? Yes, well, actually, uh, uh, whatever the risk, whatever the risk uh, you can implant a valve uh, after the age of 75. This is your, your then recommendation. But, but in France, and I am not talking about Germany or Italy, or I don't know, but the high authority of health, I said that between 65 and 75, if the patient doesn't want surgery, if you cannot convince him to go to surgery, and if he, he absolutely wants to study, it is reimbursed by the social security. It means that you can do it. So more or less, you know, 65 years is the border. Below this age, younger age, personally, uh, I am uh, almost 
trying to convince the people to get the operation, not, not heavy, because uh, we have still uh, this uh, uncertainty concerning the, the, the durability of this device. And uh, I am not very uh, hearing, you know, a, a lot of problems because we have now patients in our series, you know, uh, across the border of 14 years of follow up, you know, without any problems. So we know that it can work like a surgical neuroprosthesis. But when we are dealing with younger patients, we don't know. We don't know. You know, it may be a little different. So uh, in the United States, you know, uh, some of my colleagues, and uh, starting with uh, um, uh, with the uh, uh, well, they, they think that uh, you can implant TAVI at any age. Okay. Uh, Martin said that uh, we can implant TAVI at any age. Uh, even 55, for example, and then they say, uh, in case of any problems, we, we will do valinval, 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 you know, three or four times. Uh, I believe that it's not that easy, you know, to consider that we can uh, do that three or four times. I'm not sure of this. And uh, also, uh, you can, if the patients definitely refuse to be operated on, because now the patients, you know, don't like surgery at all. You know, they know, they heard about TAVI, and so they are, really uh, require uh, requesting TAVI. But if uh, the, the valve is uh, dysfunctioning after five years, for example, and if the patient is still very young, uh, you still can send him to surgery for valve replacement. So I mean, uh, you are not eliminated the possibility of operating the patients if the valve is dysfunctioning after a few years. So you have to keep that in mind. But uh, you know, the, the, the mechanical valves are also extremely good and uh, in, the, in the youngest population, and if we can uh, change a little the program of anticoagulant treatment uh, for mechanical valve, and this is on the way today, uh, it may be a, a very important alternative in the youngest population. Thank you. What do you anticipate the, the, the main uh, advancements in TAVI for the following five or 10 years? Would it be the size? Would it be uh, the fact that maybe we can recapture the valve and replace it uh, uh, with another one, what would you uh, think that are the top three main focus? Well, actually, uh, you know, uh, recapturing the valve, I don't believe that this is a very important uh, aspect because uh, uh, we have to know how to place it. You know, and, uh, today, you know, uh, with the balloon expandable valve, especially the balloon expandable valve, uh, placing the positioning the valve is no more a problem. You know, the, the, I never. The, the, the using two valves in the same patients with the, the current device, valve expandable device, is ex exceptional. You, know, you don't need that. So you don't need to focus on the recapturing. Uh, maybe for, for the, uh, the cells expanding, it's, it's another question. But for the, for the valve expandable, it's not a problem at all. So uh, I think that uh, we will have some improvement of the device, uh, some uh, next generation of uh, device as well, you know, delivery system and valve will be a little modified. Um, I think that the main, uh, the main point would be uh, not so much with the size of the sheets, because today we sport in French, you know, we can do that in 94% of the patients, you know. Uh, but uh, I know that the company is working on uh, decreasing the size again a little more. And uh, so if you come with a, with a 10 French, for example, then you will have a 98% possibility of implanting the valve transfer more. But the, 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 the most um, important aspect would be probably to, uh, to change the, the leaflets, you know, the structure of the leaflets, you know, to use some other material, uh, some other, uh, maybe polymeric or uh, more than uh, biologic, or maybe uh, made of uh, human tissue, you know, which uh, may decrease the rate of uh, dysfunction, if ever it's, it's uh, questions. And, uh, its limitations. I am. I am not sure of that. Nobody knows exactly. You know how much, how long the valve, the durability of the valve is today. But um, I think the, the changing the structure of the leaflets will be probably the, the next step. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, one minute left. What would you advise the young cardiologists that are watching us? Um, what would be uh, your advice for their career, for the future career? Uh, well, actually, in the field, uh, uh, your their overall career, I don't know, but you know, in the field of uh, if they want to be interventional cardiologists and if they want to implant valves, 
they have to do that very quickly and they, they definitely have to follow some uh, some uh, training programs you know we have training programs everywhere in the world uh, don't uh, don't improvise never you know follow the steps uh, you know this uh, study is a lot of tips and tricks that you have to learn and uh, you know each one uh, may be a life-threatening if you don't follow the, the the advice of the of the older people so you have to follow training programs you have to go on site you know to see if experienced people doing that you have to try to uh, work with them uh, side by side and uh, you have also to do everything you can to, to follow the, uh, the the results and the, the change in technology and so on and uh, but this is a very uh, very exciting mm -hmm. thing you know the interventional cardiology field is moving so fast now in all directions not only on TV, of course <laughs> Yes, uh, you, you spoke about, about training. Can you give us um, uh, quickly some details about your minimalist uh, uh, program that you are teaching oh. right now and how people can attend that? Yes, well, actually, uh, we, uh, we have uh, three uh, training programs every year. Uh, so uh, actually, we, we were doing this, uh, this training program in the training center in Rouen. So the people have to come to Rouen you know, to participate in the, in the training programs, uh, which is uh, more or less sponsored you know, by companies, but uh, uh, they, there is a grant uh, which is uh, in the hands of uh, Invivox, Invivox, I-N-V-I-V-O-X.com. So they can go to this, uh, to this um, site and uh, they can find all the information concerning training programs. Well, today, uh, since the pandemic, you know, we, we have to move to a webinar, but uh, we will, uh, as soon as possible, we'll come back to the, the, the present show, you know, because uh, uh, during these training programs, not only we are showing slides and we are, but also we are doing live cases, of course, but they can work on, uh, on the simulators, which is also something very important. Uh, just for them to touch the device, you know, to understand the way it works. And uh, so we have some uh, and, uh, and work, you know, uh, uh, on the different um, uh, category of uh, closing devices and uh, all these things, you know. So everything is put in a, in a, in a seminar which lasts uh, two and a half days. And uh, so also for, we, we talk a lot about the selection of patients, how to select the patients, the way to interpret the, uh, the, the, the CT scan, you know, which is extremely important. So we, we have simulators on CT scan and simulators on the, on the valve. So uh, this is uh, very, very appreciated by the people. And some, only small groups of 30, 35 people, not more than that. Great. So we will, we will put the link uh, and, uh, on the newsletter uh, that we will send to everybody. Thank you so much, Professor Crivier. It was, really a, it, it was a pleasure. It uh, was a pleasure. Yes, our audience is uh, also enchanted. Thank you so much, and I hope okay. to see you soon. Have Thank nice you day. very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.